They're in sports. Pardon me. <laughs> no. I can't watch the news when they're in sports anyway. <laughs> I gave up on it. But, you know, again, I, I know I sound like I'm beating the pulpit, and I'm sorry, no, but this no, is at no. the root of my... Yeah, it's at the root of my book, you know, Contact with sure. Beings of Light. That's what our paranormal research is about. It's not research per se. As a matter of fact, I don't know very many true researchers. <laughs> I've, asked this, I've asked this question. I've had debates with some of these people. I asked, the question I always ask them is, what's the point? Yeah. I mean, you know, it was like this uh, famous show on the History Channel, Ghost, what is it, Ghost Hunters? Ghost. It's on a sci-fi channel. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a fun show, and I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm just, you know, their main thesis was, we're trying to prove that ghosts are real. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I think 99% of the population has had some experience with this. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, polls, I, like USA Gallup polls that have said at least 75% have had a paranormal experience. Yeah, That's just yeah exactly. And so my point was, well, okay, what's the point? Now, what are you doing for the people out there that are having these experiences. Well, some people claim I pray over them. I'm trying to rid them of demonic influences and so forth, but they don't understand the basic error in all this. Basically, what people who are in our field, the paranormal researchers and other enthusiasts and what have you, have one thing going for them. The fact that they believe that these things are real indicates an elevated consciousness. Now, there are a lot of people out there who couldn't care less which is, I guess, in a manner of speaking, a sort of extreme skepticism. But they don't care. They're more interested in what kind of car they're going to own, or they're more interested in what they're going to do at the next holiday, and on and on and on. But not very many people out there have an elevated level. Um, the people who are out there, I love them all. I'm on Facebook, and I, I see what they have to say. It's lovely, and I'm happy for them, because at least it indicates they're there. They know something is there. They, they're, they're sure of it. Oh, yeah, and so they're trying to gather up as much support for what they know to share with other people. Now, that's wonderful, but you have to take it a step further. And I brought up names from the old days that probably you would, you would be familiar with, Kevin. And these were, these, were, these were the old people like uh, P.D. Ospinsky, for example, or J.G. Bennett, and others that came long before any of the modern crop of paranormalists. I knew some of these people personally, right? Well, now, they all had one... We're just, about at the, we're just about at the half hour break. Oh, I'm talking. Are too you much. kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I well, like I'm, you better shut me up, Kevin. Time oh, no, just flies no, no, no. when you're having fun, no, doesn't no, it, Kevin? No, don't shut up too much. We just want to. We're going to take about a, a three to four minute break here for some commercial announcements, and we'll be right back. I might run down the hall real quick, and we'll uh, come back and talk about a lot of other interesting things. Hi, right, it's good to be back with our excellent guests, uh, Peter Gatilla, Terry Albright, and Samara. Uh, Samara, uh, introduce yourself. I didn't know you were on the line there. Uh, oh, uh, yes. Um, hi, I'm Samara. Um, I've been a, a long-time uh, enthusiast of uh, all things paranormal and um, spiritual and metaphysical. Um, I, Peter, you know, he counts on me to to be his, you know, his tracker. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I found a, a really a good print the other day. Um, and and uh, so I just you know I just catalog uh, the prints for him. Um, we go down to the river down over here, um, the Santa Ana River, and um, you know I I have seen some remarkable uh, f you know uh, prints. Oh, and you understand? You understand? I, <laughs> yeah. I, did you, did no, we put that up on the it, website? It, She's a cracker jack cra a tracker. Some of them are just mm. just unbelievable. Uh, well, now, now, I, I just, Mara, now, hold up. Now these mm -hmm. prints are they human or what are they? Uh, there's prints. I feel. I mean, well, I, I have my own uh, ideas yeah, about them, yeah, but I pretty think, weird. About I think it's, we we got some we got some creatures that are are coming through the portals and um and they're leaving their uh, their footprints behind. Yeah. And they look like animal prints, uh, like they great do. big uh, uh, mountain lion prints. But, you know, they're 10 inches across, that kind oh. of thing. Well, you know, well, no, I think we put the one up on the site, didn't we? I got I got I got hey, I wanted to, yeah, I think we did. I wanted to say one thing about Tamara. She's a Native American, uh, a beautiful Native American woman. And uh, I'm also uh, really uh, connected to the Native Americans. I have a Sioux in name, for example. I was made an honorary Sioux, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and I have, you know, a lot of friends uh, who are natives. And 
Uh, she is just absolutely a one, and I I've, I can't say it enough. But you know, as a tracker, interested in Bigfoot, which has been uh, you know on my you know bumpy cerebrum for many years, she was there uh, most of the time and would find tracks where nobody was able to find anything. Really? So she's wow. quite a love, yeah. It's quite She'll awesome. go out with me. Yeah. And let the others do other things. But Samara and I will go out tracking down by the creeks and look in the mud. And she's kind of a kind of a good buddy to have along there. Well, well Terry, know. Terry, you're a good tracker too. I mean, you know, I've known Terry for years, and he he's the kind of guy that will you know drive his four wheel drive. I mean, this man can drive a four wheel drive better than anybody I know, or except maybe excepting Tom. You just don't know very no, many people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I do. But no, you actually—he drives so well with that thing, and he'll actually drive over footprints. I mean, he wow. drives. He, he, drives <laughs> he drives right to them. I've never seen anything like that either. Well, you know, the old nose knows. Yeah. Well, now, I don't know what it is with me, but uh, I've been pretty sensitive most of my life, and being around Peter, of course, makes that much more. Well, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's transference. It's a transference effect for all of us. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, you're, group. for those who are not familiar with y'all, y'all are uh, in California. What what part of California are you basically located? Or uh, all of us? Well, well, at the moment, I think we're. I think that portal is drifting around at the moment. <laughs> I'm we're all spread out. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I'm seeing flashes of light here. But no, we're in Southern California. I live in Upland, and that's where I'm calling from, or that's where we're talking from, uh, to you from now. And we're all basically Southern California. Right? Well, we always, always have been. You know, I lived down with the studios for a long time because I had to be at the studio at 6 o'clock in the morning, so I live right down there by Universal Studios. But uh, some of us live in Downey, some in Long Beach. I live up, up in the high desert where we used to have all of the Bigfoot goings on. Oh, yeah. By the way, uh, remind Matt on uh, finding Bigfoot. It's Bigfoot, not Bigfoots. Okay. Every time Matt says that, you know, I love it. I went up and did the show, and I'll tell you what. Every time he says that, my wife and I cringe. So we're going to have to write him a letter, I guess. Or Sasquatch, yeah, well, as he called him. Yeah, well, you know, the thing I like is the big feet. Big. Uh, you know, we have big <laughs> feet over here. Oh, I got, I got a few big feet down here, too. You know? Well, it's like well, saying deers or mices, you know. Anyway, had to get that little plug in there. Or, yeah, or, or uh, have you done much for moose. moose. <laughs> have, you all huh? done much, have you all done much of the Pacific Northwest as far as tracking these big foot? Oh, yeah. Out? Yeah, I spent years at it, Kevin. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was a little, uh, a little nostalgic today because some of these people are dying off. And, you know, I knew, I knew most of the old timers. I've been in Canada and Washington and Oregon and Northern California and other parts of the West and, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, w- people don't know just how much evidence has been found to validate the existence of of these creatures, and I don't know that they ever will know. Uh, at this late date, I'm not sure uh, yet what we're dealing with. It's all very well and good to suggest that we're dealing with some sort of unknown, uh, slobbering biological creature, but I'm beginning to have some. Uh, I'm beginning to have some doubts about that. You know, well, if you if you look at uh, Dorothy's book or Peter's book, Dorothy got a picture inside of a uh, inside of a, a UFO with a Bigfoot standing there right beside the little entity who was <laughs> flying the spacecraft. Yeah. Now that's a rather interesting picture. It's on our you website know, that, too. That reminds me of that book we mentioned on another show that about um, oh golly, the Colin Culliher and George Knapp. They had that mm-hmm. the Skinwalker Ranch up in Utah. Right. And, and what the what was they called? It was the Ute Indians? That was Bob Bigelow, wasn't it? Yeah, Bob Bigelow essentially financed the uh, yeah the, the investigation, which lasted mm. eight years. And mm. the way things came up was this far- ranching family that, for those not familiar with, a ranching family uh, had this ranch, and they started experiencing all kinds of exotic, like you're talking about, Bigfoot kind of creatures. A 400 right. pound wolf appeared out of nowhere, and uh, mm. the rancher tried to shoot it with a 30 odd six, and the, mm. didn't phase it at all, and they saw UFOs, uh, weird, oh, yeah. the whole panorama. And uh, well, I tried to reach Bigelow, you know. Did you? I know, I know, of, I know of at least a half dozen other places that are that active. 
Yeah, I know. I think he mentioned that on another show that they did. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm trying to get, uh, of course, this is the Epic Voyagers show that I'm filling in for for Ken Cherry mm-hmm. and his group. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I I want to get Ken to get me in on that Pennsylvania uh, investigation because... Oh, yeah, really... that's... <clears throat> you know, I knew Stan Gordon. My first contact with Stan Gordon, who really was the spearhead of all the activity, all the, all the investigations into much of the activity in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And I, I like that guy. He was a true pioneer. I, I, tend, to, I tend to cotton to the uh, originators. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of mim- a lot of mimickers now, but the originators didn't have anything to work with, and I knew them, and we were all in the same boat. And about you know, my old pal Stanton Friedman used to call it the laughter curtain. I mean, every time we o- opened our mouths, yeah. you know, well, we got ridiculed in some form or another. You know, and by the way, I wanted to mention one more thing about Native Americans. Um, sure. <clears throat> I absolutely love those people. Yeah. And there are some of the tribes uh, uh, in and, and uh, communities of, of natives throughout our country that were way ahead of the game. The Hopis, for example. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, you, you, their cosmology is in some ways very close to the cosmology of Dorothy Isaac. Now, how do these people know that? You know, yeah. I knew years ago I, I went on a spiritual quest and I met a lot of really remarkable people. We've had something to share uh, uh, along those lines, and every one of them, every one of them said to me that the Hopis should be welcomed with open arms, and that was because they were uh, enlightened. Hmm. I tend to think they were enlightened by maybe some help from afar, and after working with Dorothy for so long, and sharing in some of her experiences with her, and then having my own experiences after that period of time, I'm convinced that we can just stand before the greatness of the universe and sincerely ask, and we will be gifted with enlightenment and a kind of raising up. And that's going to happen, in my opinion. And I talked with Dorothy about this somewhat, called the advent of light, and there's a great pity, a great mercy taken upon us by higher powers in the universe. They know what we're up against, and they know that there are a lot of good, wonderful people inhabiting this planet. It's not all bad, no. but there's enough bad that it really makes it bad, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And they're going to help us at some point. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just uh, saying that... Uh... I, I'm really impressed with your ability to handle these kind of things. I know many, many years ago, it was a very, you know, like everything else, <laughs> that exotic little life, but I was going to uh, night school in Atlanta at the time, and I was go- I, the, I took a general psychology course, and I was thinking it was going to be basically, you know, uh, schizophrenic is this, and uh, this is that, and, you know, those sort of things. And uh, the professor was... Uh, a, a clinical psychologist, but he, and he taught the psychology class, but he was essentially a paranormal enthusiast. And the class was essentially Paranormal 101 instead of Psychology 101, which is okay. <laughs> yeah. I wish well, I'd had that class. Yeah, we, have, we have a member. We, have, we just met with one of them, uh, uh, a clinical psychologist and really a wonderful person. Oh, he was a great guy. But here's the thing that was kind of about it is I've had a lot of paranormalism and a lot of divine input the last couple of years. I don't know why, maybe... Oh, Irishman's mm-hmm. about ready to kick the bucket because <laughs> Patty Long had it on the way out. <laughs> but, but, well, you know, they, they thought that was funny when I converted to Catholicism five years ago. It was like I was getting in <laughs> under the door, you know. But uh, what I'm saying, though, is I started having, somehow taking that psychology class, I started having these weird dreams, like prophetic dreams, kind of minor league dreams. I mean, it wasn't like I really knew anything grand, but I'd know the next day who would call for an order and... Uh, the, you know, I have a dream the night before, and the, the circumstances would play out in the business section the next day. And it got so, it was uh, about the same time, the movie, uh, yeah. oh, golly, one of the movies with Stephen King came out about the guy that could mm. touch people and, uh, you know, would know their <laughs> comings and goings. And I was getting freaked. It was like every day this was coming, uh, it was reaching a certain acceleration. And I, I actually pray to oh, God, I can't handle this. Uh, this is driving me wacko. Uh, I don't want no more of this. And it did go away. Not 100%, but mostly. And right. what I'm saying is I really admire someone that could put up with this. Uh, it is extremely uh, difficult, Kevin. 
And one of the things I do, and I've trained people in this field for many years, and one of the things I talk about is the ability to cope with what you get. Uh, we, we've been, I think I mentioned last program that we were working on the Aubrey Sacco case. Aubrey Sacco was a young 23-year-old beautiful girl who went missing in Nepal. And we were asked by the family to see if we couldn't get some information about this psychically, right? And when you, when you, when you have empathy and when you have sensitivity, you have to be very careful what you do with it because some of these things can leaden you in such a way that it's hard to take the burden off your shoulders. And so I've tried to strengthen people that I work with about not being afraid of anything. There is nothing to be afraid of, and I can't say this enough. I've heard all the horror stories until I'm blue in the face. I came within about five feet of a standing Bigfoot in the middle of the night. Wow. I've done a, I've done a lot of ghost hunting. I've actually done cleansings, and cleansings. I've not only cleansed the local haunts, but I've also cle- cleansed territories. I can show people how this is done, but it's not for everybody because it has a lot to do with one's innate strength. And innate strength is hard to determine in people. You have to have a firm spiritual background of some kind. You have to be connected with the light in some way. And not all people are there yet. They can be if they understand it a little bit, and I can help them do that. And I did it for years. But if you're not, if you've got other things happening in your life, if your attention is being turned to many other uh, things, it can be extremely difficult. It can not only be scary, it can be disturbing in some very subtle ways. I'm a little concerned about the recent batch of searchers because I, I don't know that all of them are equipped to handle the side effects of dealing with poltergeist uh, hauntings of various types and what they think are demons. Because what happens is this will have a, a gradual det- deleterious effect on the character, on the personality, and on the thinking. And you've got to know how to shield from that. And you've got to know how to be protected from that. Now, naturally, religious people or spiritual people often have a certain measure of protection because if whatever you put before you will, will, will shield you, will protect you. Now, it can be almost any kind of belief provided it acknowledges a center of all power, uh, a, a core of all life, which might be called God, we can call, you know, the Muslims call Allah and and uh, the, the Jewish people. I mean, there are all sorts of different names for, the, for this one center of all things. Now, if you, if you know the center, now, belief not, is not always enough. There has to be some kind of intimacy of experience with this. Yeah. That even makes it better then you usually can be protected. Now, this is what I've done all these years because I had a a spiritual experience where I received directly from the center uh, of all things, the light of being. Now, that's personal to me, and it's not something I talk about generally, but this set up a constant contact where I can get indications of almost anything. And if I'm standing in front of that which is inherently evil, it's not going to come anywhere near me. I did some exorcisms myself. These were people who were very disturbed and, and ailing. One was one, some of these were directed to be to me by a physician, and the minute I started working on that individual, the entity that was living in there, that force that was living in there, uh, rebelled against me, but couldn't handle it and took off. I'll tell you a little story. I once had a, a, a woman who came to me and she said that she had been suffering from female issues that could not be dealt with in a way, in a medical way, and it was really bothering her. <clears throat> so I simply asked to receive what it was that was causing the problem. And what, now, this is going to sound weird, and if any of the listeners want to reject this, that's fine, do what you will. But when I looked at this woman's left hip, there was a snake curled in her left hip. Now, I could see it, and I knew that that was symbolic of the problem that she was suffering. So in front of my group, my class, I was, I, I was teaching a class at the time, I reached in to that hip, and I grabbed the snake by the head, 
and I started pulling that snake down her leg. And as that happened, she was screaming. It was hurting like crazy. I pulled that thing out of her foot, right? And just as I did, it became visible to everybody in the room. And it wiggled, you know, and I threw it in the air and it was gone. And that lady had complete relief of her problem. I've tried to make this point to people. You know, a couple of old friends of mine years ago had that same issue. And I'm trying to think of the name. You'll have to bear with me. I've got so many names. But anyway, this fellow went to uh, a place in South America where there was a reputed healer uh, doing healing work, natural healing work. Well, they found the guy, and he was like an ordinary guy and everything. There was nothing ceremonial or very uh, obvious about him. And they, 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 one of their colleagues, who was a scientist, by the way, had an abscessed tooth. And they didn't have any drugs with him or anything like that, and he was in real pain. So I said, okay, if this guy's a healer, let's, let's see if he, what he can do for you. So this healer, and I, mean, I know I'm truncating this story, and I, I, forgive me, but it's been a long time since I've related it. But this healer reached into this man's mouth, right? He said, sit still, and he sat quietly with him for a little bit reached into where the abscess tooth was and pulled the tooth right out, right? Oh. With his hands. And so the guy said, oh, great. He says, that, thank you for that, and then blah, 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 blah. And he didn't feel any pain, by the way. Wow. So all of a sudden, he started to cringe a little bit. And so the healer looked at him and said, are you hurting still? And he says, yes, I am. So he reached in and put his finger right where the tooth was and pulled his finger out slowly and a trail of black ants came out of this guy's mouth, right? And and the black ants went down the side of his body and onto the ground and went away, right? Well, this a key scientist who was the head, of, the head of this group realized uh, several weeks later, of course, the pain was all gone from the, from the patient. So about, I think about a week later, and the, the head scientist realized that the word uh, in that in that tribe, in their language, for pain was the same word for ant, right? Oh, really? <laughs> now, you know, it's interesting, and, I, and the snake issue thing that I went through was basically a symbolic representation of what was causing the pain. Now, this person asked me about it, and I said, I'll tell you what it's from. It's from promiscuity. Oh, really? <laughs> well, that was about as far as I went with that because that wasn't too well received. But basically, you see, ant pain, okay, the pain and the ant, the symbolic connectedness to those two things, and the snake, the serpent, and the pain, and the action that brought the serpent to to take up dwelling place in that person's body, you see. And the idea being, overall, is that our actions affect what happens inside us. Oh, right, right. I won't go any further, but you, I think you get the point. I do, I do. That's that's very fascinating. Like I say, I uh, you know, I really give you credit for dealing with these issues. I guess, you know, I I'm not scared of combative situations, but somehow, <laughs> except for the divine, the supernatural kind of gives me uh, the creeps. The uh, heebie-jeebies. <laughs> well, you know, I tell people, look, it's okay. It's the world we live in, and it's vast, and it's complicated, and it's beautiful, and there are life forms, both both visible and otherwise. And, you know, that's just that's what we're living in on this level of existence. Right. But you can live with it. You can handle it. You just have to keep your soul separate from all this other stuff, you know. Right. That's right. My old friend years ago, he's a philosopher and a mathematician, he said to me, well, the key question you ask with any movement, any process, any, any belief system is, what is it really doing for the soul? And that was the $64 question, you know. And anything we do does have an effect on who we are. You know, we do psychic work, and we do a, a method that uh, sensitives out there will be familiar with. We do, we do psychometry a lot. Oh. Now, psychometry is where you hold an object owned by another person, right? Right. And you pick up the life experiences of that person through this personal object that they've had on that, uh, with them wherever to go. Keys, for example, or a wallet, or a wristwatch, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I always told people, you know, the, the, the principle behind psychometry is that, every, is that whatever we are in our personal vibration, that is the energy as it resonates from us, and it varies from person to person. Well, this energy actually instills itself in anything we, we come in contact with. And, you know, that's the principle of psychometry. It's not just a watch or a ring or something, but if you're sitting in a chair a lot, for example, yeah. or touching a computer keyboard a lot, for example, yeah. 
the same psychometry effect occurs in those objects. And I could tell you more stories about that that I witnessed for myself, you know. I mean, certain cultures have uh, whole rituals designed around this principle.